All right, everybody. <coughs> Welcome back. Week two. You guys are the brave. You made it through one, and you came back for more. Very good. I'm very excited to have all of you tonight. I wouldn't be surprised if some more people trickle in as we go along. Um, again, if you just came in and you haven't given me homework, you can pass that up to me. Thank you to those of you who also emailed it to me. Uh, I haven't had a chance to read through all the ones that have been emailed, but I have read through a few and some really great reflections already. Um, in fact, one of the themes that I really appreciated amongst a few of you that emailed your reflections to me is the sense in which we can read the Bible and gain things from it anytime, but that having greater sense of what's happening in the context of Scripture, whether it's the language or the culture or what's happening socially or politically, helps deepen our understanding of Scripture. And, and so I'm very glad that that was a point for many of you and that that is going to be a, a major aspect of what we continue to do as we gather together throughout this study. Um, if you're just wandering in, we've got a check-in sheet. Would love for you to put a little X or a little check mark next to your name. Um, we'll try and make sure it gets passed around to everybody. And then if you need a pen or if you need clipboard or something for taking notes, it's right back there. I want to start by a word of prayer, and then we'll dive into the world behind the text for today. Heavenly Father, thank you for gathering us together. Thank you for Scripture, for your words to us that inspire us and fill us and give us hope and also show us who you are and how you have created us and what you have meant uh, for us and, and what you want us to do. And so, God, as we dive in deep to today's text in the book of Mark, we ask that you would illuminate to us what you want us to see. Uh, show us uh, all sorts of new and wonderful and good things through your word tonight. And so we give you this time, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, tonight we're going to be looking at uh, Mark 1, starting with verse 16, and then we're going to go all the way to chapter 3, verse 6. Um, yeah, we're going we're gonna to cover a decent amount of ground. In fact, I had hoped to have covered most of this last week, and uh, I got really caught up in the details of the first 15 verses. Uh, so that's okay. We're going we're gonna to make up ground, and that'll be good. Um, last week, I, in the world behind the text section, I talked a lot about political and cultural context, particularly the Roman Empire that's in the backdrop of all of this, and then what it means for Mark to have been written in the Second Temple Judaism period um, and all of the, the context surrounding that. In particular, these new sects that have arisen, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Zealots, and we only see a few of these within Mark's text, but uh, the Pharisees in particular play a very prominent role, and they're going to play a very, very prominent role in what we see tonight. Um, tonight, I'd actually like to focus a little bit more on uh, literary context as we explore the world behind the text, uh, because that's just as significant as what's happening in the culture and in the politics and the, in the social world of the first century. Uh, so really, uh, two or three things that I want to highlight to you tonight that are going to be really important for us to understand as we continue our journey through the book of Mark. First, uh, some notes about what I call biblical narrative. Well, not just me. It's what scholars call biblical narrative. Okay? Mark is primarily narrative, and I did mention this last week, that Genesis and Revelation, those two courses, have all sorts of different types of literature. Revelation is primarily what's called apocalyptic literature, so it's got all of these fanciful visions of things, very crazy imagery, metaphors, symbols, all throughout it. Genesis has a mix of narrative and then uh, genealogies as a type of narrative, poetic literature as well. 
Um, so it's a mix of all sorts of different things. And Mark does have bits and pieces of those, but it's primarily a biblical story, a narrative. Now, one of the things that we at times have a hard time understanding in the modern world as we read the Bible is that biblical narratives are not exactly the same as history or biographies in the way that we think about them in the modern world. They are certainly historical, and they are certainly biographical. But when we think about history and biography in the modern world, we typically think about laying out a bunch of events exactly as they happened in chronological order. And that's not really what's happening within Mark and Matthew and Luke and John. For them, biblical narrative is this, and, and this is worth writing down, okay? Biblical narrative is the telling of the story of God and God's interactions with people, namely his chosen people, as it seeks to convey God's plan of salvation, redemption, and new creation. Okay, so that's biblical narrative in general. I'll say it again because that was a lot of words. Okay. Biblical narrative is the telling of the story of God and God's interactions with people, namely his chosen people. So Israel... And then in the New Testament, the chosen people expand to what we call the church or followers of Jesus, Christians. So it's the telling of those interactions as it conveys God's plan of salvation, redemption, and new creation. Now, why does that matter? It matters because... As these writers are trying to tell the biblical narrative, they're going to use all sorts of different devices, all sorts of different literary structures and elements to convey their intended message as it pertains to the greater context of articulating what God is doing, particularly within the context in which they live. Okay, so Mark is going to use all sorts of imagery and symbols and literary structures that help to convey to the context to whom he was originally writing what God is doing in that moment through the person of Jesus. Does that make sense? Because he's doing this, what he's not as concerned about is all the chronological details associated with the story. It's why when you read through Mark, and you see all of these stories laid out, and then you read through Matthew, and you see similar stories, but they're not in the same order as in Mark. That's what's happening. Mark is trying to tell a very particular story in a very particular way to his audience, and Matthew's trying to tell a very particular story to a very particular people to his audience, and they utilize some of the same stories, but they put them in different orders and tell them in slightly different ways to convey exactly what it is that they want to convey. So then the greater question for us is, what is it they're trying to say? What do they want us to see as we read through the text? And that's the work that we are doing all together here through this study. We're trying to figure out what is it that Mark is trying to say, not just to first century readers, but of course to us now as God continues to inspire scriptures as we read them, okay? So that's one part of this, the way that writers of the New Testament and the Bible in general tell stories is not exactly the same as the way we would do it today, especially as we think about history and biography, okay? And one of the really uh, specific ways that, that um, biblical writers tell these stories in ways that are different than we tell stories is through the use of different forms of telling the story. And those of you who are part of my Genesis class, you learned about one of these types of literary devices that's really prominent. It's called a chiasm. Anyone that was part of the Genesis class remember what a chiasm is? Crickets. Chirp, chirp, chirp. 
<laughs> it's not total chaos. It's actually the complete opposite of total chaos. It's very organized, very structured, but in a way that's different than we would often tell stories in the modern world. So when, in the modern world, when we tell a story, often we want to set up the characters, the setting, the plot, and then as we go along through the plot, it builds and builds to a climactic point, and then there's a resolution. And there are elements of that, certainly, within biblical storytelling. But they often don't leave the climax toward the end, although we will see that certainly within each gospel, right? The death and resurrection of Jesus is the climactic point, certainly. But there are also things they want to emphasize along the way within the middle. And so they use this structure called a chiasm to do exactly that. It's a way of repeating similar words or phrases or imagery so that it highlights something within the structure of that form. So let me, and I know that's a lot of words, so it's better for me to just show you how it works, okay? And, and we're going to see some of this tonight, okay? So a biblical writer will take, let's say, a word, and they will emphasize a word in one little part of a story or in one verse, okay? So let's say that word is joy, for example, okay? And then they'll write another verse, and they'll emphasize a different word, like peace. And then right in the middle, they'll emphasize this word. Now, if they really want to emphasize this word the most, what they're going to do is they're actually going to repeat the themes of the first two to make this the central point of what they are talking about. So they're going to tell another verse or tell another story about peace. And then they're going to tell another story about joy. And so in creating a structure like this, they, they have actually focused in, narrowed in on the thing in the middle rather than at the end. Does that make sense? That's a chiasm. A chiasm is using repetition to point towards something that's in the middle of that chiastic structure. Now, you, all of you have blank looks right now, which is fine, but we're actually, we're gonna see a chiasm tonight and, and you're going to be like, oh, that makes so much sense. And then once you start to see chiasms in your own individual reading, you'll actually see them a lot because they're all over Scripture. Um, my favorite example of this is the book of Leviticus. That entire book is a chiasm. So it's, it's talking about all sorts of different things. And then right in the middle, what it really wants to emphasize is the Day of Atonement. So the most significant thing in the book of Leviticus is the Day of Atonement, which is right in the middle of the book. And everything on both sides of it is pointing to that preeminent part of the narrative. Okay? Okay. So we're going to see that in Mark in just a moment. Here's what I want to do tonight. Um, and, and this is the, the third and final point of the world behind the text that I want to cover tonight. Biblical writers intend for their stories to be read within communities. Um, in the modern world, we're very accustomed to reading the Bible individually, and it gets emphasized in our teaching and preaching about it, and that's a good thing. We should spend time in Scripture on our own, reflecting and listening to the voice of the Spirit to us individually. But biblical writers pretty much entirely intend for audiences of multiple people to read their texts to then discuss with one another about the meaning and what that text is trying to say to them in their local community. Um, and we see this, we actually see this playing out within Mark. Jesus, in, in, in a couple of stories that we're going to see even tonight, he's going to be gathered with other people and they're going to be discussing scripture with one another. And he's going to be teaching and things like that. Um, and, and they intend for there to be discussion about what's happening in the text. So part of doing this study, every week of this study, I mean, we are doing exactly that. We are gathering together to discern what God is trying to say to us. 
Um, but tonight I want to do that in a little bit different way than what we experienced last week. So here's what I want to do. Um, I want to get into groups of three people, and it's kind of important that we keep it to three, although I think we may have 23 people here now, so we might have to do a group of two or a group of four. Um, find a, a, a group of three people, three people around you, and I'm going to assign part of what we're going to cover tonight. I'm going to assign that to your group. You're going to read through whatever passage I assign to you, and then you're going to discuss amongst the three of you what is this story trying to say? Like, what is the major point of the story? And then you're going to come up with a one-sentence summary of the story that you're going to then share with the whole group. So you're going to find, you're going to, you're going to find a person within your group who is comfortable speaking amongst everyone else who can summarize in one sentence what's happening within that story. <laughs> My job is to equip you. This is me equipping. <laughs> okay. Oh, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. Okay. So, uh, yeah, get into, let me see. Let me make sure I have enough people. Four, nine, twelve, seventeen, twenty, yep, twenty-four. Oh, perfect. That'll work. Okay, groups of three. That means there are eight groups. Okay, so get into groups of three really quickly. Once you have your groups of three, I'll start assigning which story you're going to look at. Let's gather back together. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to call on each group in the order of the, the narrative, the way that Mark writes it. I'm going to hear from you what the main point and what your summary sentence is, and then I'll highlight a couple of other things that I think could be worthwhile for us to hear from that individual story. N not the whole thing, no. Just your sentence. In fact, yeah, your main point and your sentence. Is, that's fine. That's fine. Very good. All right, here we go. Group number one. Jesus called, his, called them, follow me, and immediately they followed him and became his fisher of men. Very good. Okay, so Mark 1, 16 through 20, is Jesus calling his first disciples. They're fishermen, and he literally says to them, I will make you fishers of men. A couple of things that are worth pointing out that are behind the scenes here. In Jewish culture of that day, uh, the rabbi and disciple relationship was like the preeminent, the most important, wonderful thing that you could be a part of. It would be like if you became a celebrity today, and, and, and in fact, in social media culture, uh, we actually have similar type language. You have celebrities, and then you have their followers on social media, right? In the, in the ancient world, especially within the Jewish world of this time, the rabbi was the celebrity. Rabbis would travel around from place to place, and they would give dramatic teachings, and they would debate with other rabbis, and people were always interested in what these rabbis had to say. And so they always wanted to be followers of those rabbis so they themselves could be like their rabbi someday. Now what's fascinating here, though, is that in the culture of that time, the pupils would approach the rabbi first to try to become one of their disciples. That was part, they had this long process actually from childhood where kids that four, five, six years old would memorize, and I mean memorize, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, word for word. They would memorize it. 
as young, young children. And then the best of the best students would go on to memorize the rest of the Hebrew scriptures. And once they came of age, around 12, 13, 14 years old, if they were the best of the best students, they would approach a rabbi and ask them if they could be their disciple. Those who were not the best of the best would go home and try and figure out their parents' trade and make a living in some way or another. So we have fascinating dynamics happening here where the rabbi is approaching these men who are with their father, which is assigned to us. They're no longer in school. They're learning their father's trade, which means they were not the best of the best pupils. They were meh. Okay. Average men. Yep. Yep. In fact, my commentary suggests that they're kind of middle class, that they're, they're not the poorest of the poor uh, because they're fishermen and it's a lucrative business, but they're not the best of the best. And Jesus comes to them and asks them to follow him. Again, we talked last week, some of the things that Mark says about Jesus and that Jesus already does in the first 15 verses would be very mind-blowing, even scandalous. This is another example of that. The, the whole, there's a whole system set up for how disciples and rabbis interact, and Jesus upends that in his first interactions. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very good. Next group. Jesus taught and spoke with such authority, quite unlike the other scholars, that he broke out the devil Very good. Yes, very good. So in verses 21 through 28, we have uh, Jesus doing some teaching on the Sabbath in the synagogue, and then the people are just amazed at how he teaches. So in those days, in fact, it's actually somewhat similar in Judaism today. Most teachers, rabbis, what they would do is really elaborate upon the, the Torah, about, upon the law. And, and really what they were trying to do is just extrapolate how are we supposed to live in light of the texts that we have. And they'd have discussions and debates with one another about how to do this. Jesus comes along and teaches, as the scriptures say, with an authority. In other words, and you, we'll see this more as we keep going. It's a, a new way of understanding and, and a, a sort of sense in which he's giving a new way of life, a new command, a new Torah to the people. That's part of what they're so amazed by, is that he's not like the other rabbis that are saying, "Here's we, we've got this ancient book and we're going to try and figure out how to live. Jesus is saying, this is how we live, I'm showing you, and I'm teaching you how to do it. And then he actually does it in the driving out of demons, these uh, forces of the evil one who were plaguing the people in those days, and um, to, to a certain extent still do in our current world. Yeah, very, very good, very good. We're going to keep seeing this, actually. Okay, so it's what scholars call the messianic secret in the book of Mark. Way to see that. Okay, it's fascinating. Mark multiple times highlights how Jesus tells, in this case, demons. We're going to see it again with people who get healed. Don't tell anybody about this. Uh, one of the things that was happening uh, in the first century was that there were actually lots of people who claimed to be messiahs and they claimed to be people who could heal and claimed that they had all sorts of power and authority. In fact, Jewish historian Josephus tells us all about all sorts of different messiahs in that day and age and how they make people get all riled up and, and then they would try to uh, form some sort of coup to throw over the government, and um, those never worked out all that well. And one of the ways they do this is they'd, they'd go into a community and they'd come up with some sort of healing, usually they were just tricking people, and then they'd say, tell everybody about this. Rally as many people together as we can get 
so that we can form this band that takes over and overthrows the Romans. So it seems as though Mark is explicitly trying to say that's not what Jesus is doing. He's not here to overthrow the Romans in the way all these other messiahs are trying to do. He's not like all these other spiritual healers that are trying to make a big name for himself. He's about more than that. And so Jesus keeps saying, shh, don't tell anyone. And then, of course, they tell everyone. <laughs> they don't keep it a secret at all. And, and Mark uh, points that out multiple times. Great observation. Very good. Uh, next group. Yeah, um, very good. So in this story, we have, this is right after the, the, the synagogue scene that we just had, and they go to the home of um, Simon's mother-in-law who's sick, and Jesus heals her. And then all sorts of people are coming to Jesus to receive healing and to um, be released from demon possession. Yeah, really, really good. And it's noteworthy uh, to me that the demons are no match for Jesus. Mark makes this abundantly clear, as do the other Gospels. And, and, and I think it's worth saying that in, even in our current culture, um, I admit to you, sometimes I get a little anxious when I hear people talk about spiritual warfare in our current day and age. Because the way that it gets described to me sometimes, it's as if what the devil and the demons are doing in our world is almost as powerful, maybe almost as powerful as God and Jesus. Like, like even the term spiritual warfare conveys to me that we're not sure who's going to win. The war is still happening. That's not the way the New Testament declares what Jesus is doing. It declares Jesus has the victory, that Jesus has already won, that the powers and forces of evil are no match for him, and that when we call upon the name of Jesus, we invoke that same sort of power as well. I like to emphasize that because of, like what I just said, I think sometimes we have a tendency to give the devil and evil spiritual forces too much power and too much credit. Jesus has overcome. Okay, that's clear here, and it's clear throughout the book of Mark. Very good. Uh, next section, verses 35 through 39. Okay, so it says to preach the gospel was more significant to him than to heal the sick. And he prayed before he went um, and he decided to go ahead and, and go to the other towns and places to preach. Yeah, very good. And that prayer part is really noteworthy. Again, and with the, the messiahs and the spiritual healers of that day, they're just going around all over the place trying to gather up more followers, more people to join their cause. And it's noteworthy that Mark says, Jesus pulls away to a solitary place to pray. Yeah. And it's from prayer, that place of being in communion with God, that he goes back into the mission as Pat pointed out very well, to go and preach. And then he goes about preaching and driving out demons and healing more people, which brings us to uh, verses 40 through 45. So a leper approaches Jesus and asks if he's willing to heal him. Jesus has compassion. He cleanses him, or, you know, heals him, tells him, don't go out and tell anybody, and he immediately turns around and goes and tells everybody. <laughs> yeah, right, yes, yes. So another, another example of don't tell anyone, and he's out there telling everybody. Yeah, very good. Exactly. Exactly. 
Exactly, and that's part of what Mark is trying to convey, I think, okay? A uh, couple of things here, okay? So um, we have this man who has leprosy, and leprosy, when we read it in the New Testament, is really just a catch-all for any sort of skin disease, especially really painful ones in the ancient world. So it, we don't know exactly which skin disease he has, and it may not be the same leprosy that still exists today. Um, but he has something painful from which he needs to be healed. And the text says that Jesus has, this is a great Greek word. Here's your first Greek word of today. Jesus has splagnitzomai. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You definitely want to write this one down. It's a long word. It's the word that gets translated in the NIV as compassion. But quite literally, splagnitzomai is referring to the guts. Okay. In other words, he's moved to the most inward parts of himself. He has a deep, deep, deep feeling of needing to care for this person. It's not just a, well, that'd be nice if I healed this guy. It's like within the most inward part of himself. It's, the, you know, in, in our uh, modern world, we often talk about the heart as like the seat of emotions, right? That's our heart goes out to someone who is in pain, right? Splagnitzomai is the ancient way of talking about that. I feel it to the depths of my guts, well within my being. So, so he's deeply moved by this man. Yeah, it has compassion to him. Splagnitzomai, yep, very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be a tough one. Okay, all right. Uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Our sentence is, Jesus is calling out the scribes for doubting his authority when they knew he was coming because God had foretold his coming, and they were amazed. Yeah, so in 2, 1 through 12, we have a story of the paralyzed man. This is, uh, and this is a story you've probably heard many, many times throughout your life, many times in sermons, many times in Sunday school. Got a paralyzed man. Jesus is teaching and in a house, and uh, they can't get the paralyzed man into the house. So they take him up on the roof, tear a hole in the roof, lower him down, and says to him, Kind of, at first glance, an odd phrase, your sins are forgiven. Um, And that actually creates quite a bit of tension because you have all of these religious leaders around who are talking with him, having discussion, and they know full well, based on the scriptures, human beings are not the ones who forgive sins. It is God who forgives sins. And then it's the duty of the priests to declare that sins have been forgiven. Okay, so the Jewish people uh, would go to the temple, present sacrifices for forgiveness so that God would forgive them, and the priest's job to declare to them that through their sacrifice that God has forgiven them. So Jesus is either doing one of two things that are both Uh, very controversial to these religious leaders. He's either pronouncing their sins are forgiven himself, which is why they say, oh, that's blasphemy, sir. Um, Or he is enacting the role of the high priest, of which they don't think he is, which to them would also be blasphemy. So either way, he's speaking beyond what they think that he should be speaking. So this creates quite the controversy. And then Jesus says... Well, what's easier to do for me to declare that this man's sins are forgiven 
or to heal him. And then he gets up and walks away. Okay. So the point, as was said, like they should be able to recognize that this Jesus is the one who is to come, the one who God has ordained as his anointed one, his Messiah, who has the ability to do all these sorts of things, and yet they don't see it, and they don't trust it. And yet, fascinatingly enough, in this particular story, at the end, everyone's amazed, even the religious leaders. That's not going to stay the case for very long, though. John, you had your hand up. I just wanted to say that Jesus just cut out the middle man. <laughs> Jesus is priest and son of God all in one. Yes, certainly in this story, that's what is being depicted. Pat. One of the pastors that was preaching on this said that the guys had ropes that were faith, hope, love, and compassion. That was who the guys with the... Yeah, that's cool. That and that, yeah, that's a really helpful image. Um, some of that uh, is a bit speculative because we don't see that explicitly within the text, but it's very possible that that occurred. Yeah, very cool. So, are we saying that he was lame because he sinned? So, in the ancient world, particularly within the first century, most people believed that. Uh, diseases of that sort were caused either by that person's sin or by the sin of one of their um, ancestors. So usually a parent or a grandparent. Usually they, they tend to keep it within two or three generations. So that's what the common belief was. However, one of the things Jesus helps people to see is that that's not actually the case. So he's declaring forgiveness of sins even though the fact is he's probably not a sinner, but by declaring forgiveness of sins, what this man also receives besides healing is entrance back into the community, right? Because in, I'm glad you brought this up. This is so important, and I would have missed it had you not brought it up. In Jewish culture at that time, being a part of the community was one of the most important parts of life. Right? It's why when you read the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, oftentimes a punishment for doing something wrong is to be cast out of the community right? because you're unclean. Right? And people with diseases like this, they are unclean. So they're often cast out of the community. So fascinating dynamics here in the sense that this man already has friends. Um, we kind of take that for granted. But in this world, he probably shouldn't have had any friends, um, which speaks to us about the faith of his friends, that it is their faith as much as the paralytic's faith that plays a role in this story. Powerful that they were willing to even do this. And probably, that's very likely, yep. So, in fact, to this point in the story, most of the people that Jesus has healed or interacted with are outcasts of some kind, right? Anyone who has diseases, you're unclean, you're an outcast, right? These fishermen, again, they're kind of middle class, but you're going to see more and more how they themselves are outcasts of sorts. Um, anyone who's been possessed by a demon, oh yeah, outcast. <laughs> Yeah, we're not keeping you in the community, sir. Um, and that, that is a, a major part of Mark's gospel. Um, in fact, it, um, Steve and Linda brought this up last week. You see all these people who come to Jesus with faith, and Jesus heals them. All those people are outcasts. It's the people that you would think would understand it and have it together that don't the religious leaders, political authorities, those sorts of folks, they don't. And even the disciples who spend all this time with Jesus, we're going to see later in the story that they don't get it really either. So, yeah, really, really great observations, great points, great questions. Uh, let's move on before we spend too much time in that one section. Uh, verses 13 through 17. 
we, we noticed that uh, in this portion of scripture that Jesus in these scriptures wanted to spend time with his, 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 his people. In other words, the people who were carpenters, the people who were diseased, or the people who they felt knew were sinners, but not with the righteous. So, to, but he did not want to spend his time with the righteous, but he wanted to spend his time with the sinner to save the sinners of the world. Yeah, so we, we, we're all, we, perfect segue really into this section. I mean, this whole section about Jesus eating with Levi, the tax collector, out like almost as far an outsider as you can think of in the, that time frame in the Jewish world because the tax collectors worked for the Romans, which, ah, bad Romans, okay? And not only that, they often... Um, abused the Jewish people. They often took too much money from them. In fact, it was part of their role as tax collectors to take a little bit from people, a commission of sorts, and they often um, took way more than they were supposed to. And so Jewish people hated tax collectors. They hated them. And Jesus sits down to eat with one and a bunch of other sinners as well. What they, they owed, correct, they the correct, correct. The yes, but are right. The Jews, they don't, when they loan, they're not to charge tax or interest. Or interest. Yes. Interest. So this is not an, a loan. These are tax collectors for the Roman government. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah, this is, the, again, like the, the Jewish people, because they're being subjugated by the Romans, they hate the Romans anyway, and these people... Often, by the way, tax collectors often of Jewish roots, so they're traitors, mm -hmm. and they're working for their oppressors. Right. Yeah, so a big, yeah, yeah, right. In fact, um, most scholars think Levi and Matthew are actually the same person. Yeah, so one gospel calls them Levi and others call them Matthew. Mm -hmm. He talks about how... Jesus chose these men and what gifts or qualities they had. Yeah. Yeah, no, and, and that's fascinating because if you choose a tax collector be, to be a part of your 12, what sort of qualities do they have that could be useful to you? They're probably good with money. Yeah. Yeah. Ironically, though, Judas is the treasurer of the group. That doesn't work out so well, does it? Uh, yeah. But Levi, I'm sure, has other qualities, uh, including the, the ability to keep track of money that's worthwhile. Yeah. And after Judas betrays Jesus, it's very likely that Levi played a part in managing the funds for the apostles as the church starts its spread. Very good. Very good. Good. All right. Uh, 18 through... 22. So, so that's our, chap, our group there. So Jesus is questioned about fasting. So the John's disciples and the Pharisees were questioning because fasting was what they knew. And they wondered why Jesus' disciples were not fasting. But Jesus explains to them in ways they can understand that you can't put a patch on old clothes and expect it to work forever nor can you put old new wine in old wineskins. So he's saying he is all new. His way is new. Um, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And they, because of how they had been taught all those years, I would imagine they had a hard time grasping that we don't have to do that anymore. We can just go to him. He's the one. He's the one that we need to fast and pray when we need, but why would the disciples do that if he was with them? Because the Savior was with them, they would have no need to fast. Good, very good, very good, very good. Yes, so in the, uh, this time period, uh, it was a sign of religious devotion to fast. There were some days and seasons in which Jewish people were required to fast, but the Pharisees in particular often emphasized other days for fasting as a sign of your devotion to God. 
Now, as we read in other texts, they would often like make a big show of their fasting and praying. Matthew highlights this really well. Um, and so it, it really became, uh, yeah, very showy and, and not really about religious piety. That doesn't seem to be as much the case here in this text, though. It really revolves around Jesus' presence, and Lois highlighted this well. When you have the bridegroom there, why are you fasting? It's feast time. Party! <laughs> right? Yeah, that's the big point of the story. The, I mean, why, why fast to... to gain God's favor or to enter into God's presence when God's right there in your midst. You have him, and he is creating a new way. And um, again, Lois articulated this really well, the imagery of the, the patch. You don't sew a new patch onto an old garment. Otherwise, it just par uh, tears away. You don't put new wine into old wineskins. It's a way of saying this new thing that Jesus is doing is going to upend this old way that we have done things, and it's a better way, a good way. Very good. All right. Um, I want to highlight, so I mentioned chiasm. So I want to back up just a little bit to show you something really neat here in the way that Mark writes all of this, okay? So in those first five verses of Mark, uh, or of this section, so this is Mark 1, 16 through 20, we have Jesus calling his disciples the first time. So we got the first four disciples out of this story. And then the subsequent couple of stories are about Jesus' ministry and, and what specifically is happening within the ministry. So this is 21 through 34. This is a couple of sections that we just looked at together. So it's Jesus healing and Jesus teaching. Jesus driving out demons. And then in 35 through 39, we have the story of him going off to a solitary place and praying. And at the end of that section, reinvigorated to go back into the ministry that he was doing. So that's what's happening in Mark 1 through Mark 140, sorry, through chapter 2, verse 12. So we have more stories of healing, more teaching. This time, forgiving as well. But it's all under the umbrella of Jesus' ministry. And then our chiasm ends with the calling of another disciple, Levi. So based on the structure of a chiasm that I showed you earlier, within this larger framework of the story, what does Mark want to emphasize? Bingo. Why would Mark want to emphasize that? Bingo. Yeah. So what were you going to say? He's talking with his father. Yeah. yeah, and that's where the power comes from. Yeah, so yes, you're both right. Yeah. It's in the relationship between Jesus the Son and God the Father that 
all of the ability to do the healing and teaching, forgiving and driving out demons happens. And it's why he would call disciples in the first place. Because God is doing a new thing that is rooted in relationship with God. Real relationship that doesn't have to go through mediators, even though mediators at times can be helpful, but there can be a real intimate connection between us and God. Highlighted so well in the story of Jesus' baptism that we looked at last week, the way that Jesus has such a divine um, connection with the Father in that story. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Chiasm? Yeah. Okay. Two more sections I want to look at. And I'll read through them aloud. This is chapter 2, starting with verse 23. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? And he answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. All right. So we have this story of Jesus and his disciples are walking along through a grain field. They're just picking heads of grain on the Sabbath. The Pharisees notice this. Why are you allowing them to do this? Because they are under the understanding that picking heads of grain uh, classifies as what they would call reaping. Um, And reaping is explicitly prohibited within Jewish law on the Sabbath. It is work. And Sabbath, literally, the Hebrew word Shabbat, means stop or cease. It means you're not supposed to do any sort of work that you would be doing the other six days of the week. And so the Pharisees, very strict on Sabbath observance. And so they see these disciples of Jesus picking heads of grain and like, why are you allowing them to do this? This is unlawful. Jesus' rebuttal is fascinating because he doesn't actually try to rebut the Jewish law. Instead, he refers to David and a fascinating little story in 1 Samuel about how David and some of his companions go into the temple, which they're not supposed to do, and they go up to this um, area where there's some loaves of bread. There are loaves of bread that would be put right outside the Holy of Holies on the Sabbath that are dedicated to the priests. It's for the priests to be able to eat on the Sabbath because their job was to mediate between God and all the people. And so they didn't do a lot of cooking and they didn't do a lot of, um, well, they did some cooking, but they didn't do agricultural work to get all the crops that they needed for that stuff. So it was provided for them to be able to eat. So it's supposed to be dedicated to the high priests, and yet David goes in with his companions and they eat of it because they are so hungry. And there seems in 1 Samuel a sort of exception was made for David and his companions in this case. Technically, they broke the law, but because they were so hungry, God was compassionate and merciful and allowed this to happen. So Jesus is referring to this particular story as a way of saying well, the Sabbath, it's actually just made for man, not the other way around. It's supposed to benefit us, not hinder us. It's not supposed to be some sort of thing that becomes a ritualistic burden to us. It's supposed to be a gift. 
just in the way that God gives gifts to David and his followers when they are hungry. Uh, so uh, the Pharisees, uh, probably not real crazy about this response. And we see uh, how that plays out in this next episode. So I'm going to read the first six verses of chapter 3. Isn't, uh, isn't Jesus also, in, in a fairly subtle way, saying, it's your law, not mine? Yeah. This isn't God's law that's being violated. It's your law. You, you, you're the ones who created this law. God didn't say it. I would say it's the practice of the law that has been violated. They, they have twisted. It is God's law in the sense that in the Genesis story, um, you have God taking this day of rest after he creates everything as a model for human beings for taking rest as well. Um, and it, it means an awful lot, by the way, to a bunch of people who've been slaves in Egypt, who are probably the original readers of the Genesis text. So their entire life is about doing stuff all the time. They have no break, and they have no person to advocate for them. They are only subjugated and oppressed by their slaveholders. And so when they read that for the very first time, they start to see, oh, I'm not just something that's used as a means of production for someone else. I'm an actual human being that can enjoy aspects of life. So it's both, it is a command of God, but it's supposed to be life-giving. And the way that the Pharisees were practicing it was not life-giving, it was a burden. So the law itself is from God, and it's why we ought to continue to practice Sabbath in some sense, although, again, not with the same sort of uh, ritualistic legalism as the Pharisees, but we should recognize that our lives are not all about working all the time and doing stuff all the time, that we can stop, we can enjoy, we can rest, we can cease from the activities of six days a week to find enjoyment in God's presence for one day, and then be refueled to go and do whatever it is we need to do for the other six. Does that make sense? So it's not about the law itself that Jesus was rebutting. It was about the practice of it as right. imposed well, by I, the I Pharisees. Said it badly, but essentially, that's what I meant. Okay. They, they took the command that you're supposed to rest and, in, in essence, determined you can't eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you can, you can eat, but the food's supposed to be prepared the day before. It was. All right. It was, it was yeah, and, and, and exactly, exactly, exactly. And that's the point. Yes, that's part of the point Jesus is trying to make. Exactly. Because by my understanding, it was also inappropriate to spit on Sabbath because when you spit into the dirt, it's like plowing. So yeah, yeah. Clearly that's worse. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. someone yeah. walked yeah. Yeah, I mean, Jesus is saying, no, you get right. that's not it. Yeah, exactly. So the Sabbath is supposed to be a burden. Right, yeah, it's supposed to be a gift, a life-giving gift to those who find themselves caught up in producing all the time. We, we find out, oh, we're more than just producers. We're human beings, and we can enjoy life, too. Yeah, very good. Uh, so, more on the Sabbath, right here, in verses 1 through 6 of chapter 3. Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Can you just imagine? Is he going to do something good today? Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hands, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. He said to the man, Stretch out your hand. 
He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. And then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Ooh, okay. So, another story about Sabbath. Again, this this highlights for us how seriously the Pharisees took the Sabbath, in particular the way they practiced it and their rules that they associated with the Sabbath. So much so that at the end of this story in which Jesus does something wonderful for someone, they decide, we need to get together with those people we hate, the Herodians who work for the Romans, they're part of the Romans, we need to get together with them and figure out how we can kill this guy. So there's some crazy irony happening here in this story, right? Sabbath should be about giving life, should be about doing good. Well, really it's about God doing good for us, right? And so Jesus does that for this man, heals his hand. So which is better, to do good or evil, to save life or to kill? They literally hear those words, and they go out and start a plot to kill him. So that's part of the irony that's happening here. And then the other part is that the Pharisees are so convinced that the Jewish people will be saved by getting back to Torah and living into the practices and the rules, the laws that God has commanded for them because if it weren't for us messing all that stuff up in the first place, the Romans wouldn't be here. So if we just go back to living under those laws, maybe God would save us from the Romans. And yet, they go to the very people they despise to try to kill Jesus. That's why I made a big deal, by the way, uh, last week about the context of the Romans and what's happening within Judaism, because as it turns out, those two worlds are going to come together and they're going to form an alliance to take out Jesus because of this new thing that he's doing that is absolutely revolutionary, that is upending everything for everyone, which is, I think, something that's really worthwhile for us to remember today. Um, So here's what I want to do. I'm going to give you one takeaway as we think about now the world um, from which we come from. And then I want you to get back into your little group of three. And I want you to come up with a takeaway. In fact, uh, the way I like to say this is, uh, this is our so what moment. Okay, I've given, we've had all this conversation about what's happening in the text. Uh, So what? What does it matter to us? That's what you're going to discuss in a moment. And here's the first thing that I I want to say. um, My so what moment is that Jesus is still about upending everything. We get a little bit too caught up sometimes in the way that our own world and the way our own culture operates. And sometimes we actually take Jesus and Jesus' language and just kind of apply it upon the way the rest of the world is already operating. That's not what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to inaugurate a new way, a a new kingdom, his kingdom, a new creation that's more biblical language, a new way of doing things. So we don't just slap a Jesus bumper sticker on what we already think, our own culture, our own values, What we're supposed to do is find all of our values, the life and purpose that God has given to us in Jesus and live that out in a way that's attractive to the world around us so that they leave all of their worldly ways of living and recognize that this is the best way. Jesus is the way. And that's as true now as it was 2,000 years ago. So getting you to your groups, what, what other things do you see from what we have explored tonight that really matter to you, right? What's your so what from our texts tonight? 
I'll give you about five or so minutes to do that, and then I'll call on a few of you to give me a couple of highlights of that. I can tell really good conversations and discussions happening in these small groups. I'm glad we did this tonight. I want to hear from just a few of you. What's your so what from what we explored tonight? <laughs> Take it away, Mike. I know you got a good one. I, I don't know that I do, but... <laughs> oh, I heard it. It's a good one. <laughs> Vera and I last, uh, last night, yes, last night on, on an airplane watched the Jesus Revolution movie. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Mark. Yep. It's the same thing because here they had this amazing, wonderful thing happening where all these people were so excited about their relationship with God and about Jesus. And look where they are today. Yeah. They are now organized religion. <laughs> the very thing that they were fighting against. <laughs> Because you've got Greg Lawrence, got a big fancy church yeah, in California, yeah. and yeah. Calvary Chapel is all over the country. Yeah. And they have rules, and they have, you have to do it this way, you can't do it that way. And it's just more organized religion. And in essence, it's the death of following Jesus. We're not following Jesus anymore. We're worshiping the Bible, number one, and we are secondly worshiping our rules. Mm. Yeah, a lot of good stuff in that comment from Mike, and, and, and you alluded to this, that one of the tendencies is for us to take something good from God and try to institutionalize it. Yeah, we want to make it, we want to, we want to put it in a box. Yeah, we want to put it in a box. Control it. Yes, exactly. Yep. Is it to control or preserve Yes. Because I think the initial <laughs> intention is yeah. to preserve, right? And then yeah. it just... Yeah, but the human tendency is to make ourselves into God, and so we want to control so that ego thing. That's right. In a lot of ways, that is true. And yet the Jesus movement of the first century that gets reinvigorated through revival throughout history, including the Jesus movement of the 1970s, of which the Jesus Revolution movie is referring to, always helps us find correctives so that we recognize that it's not about an institution, it's about being a part of a movement that is a living organization, or a living organism is probably a better way of describing it, that the church is a body, crazy, that's the language Paul uses, the body of Christ that is sent out into the world to be a part of God's redeeming and salvific work. And we have a tendency, as Mike noted, to, instead of being a body, become some sort of box or structure that becomes rigid. Um, and the work of the Spirit is to help break us out of that. Good. Just Ed. a comment on that, please, is that um, Vernon McGee made a, prop, a kind of a prophecy that I started to consider, and to consider think that it's kind of going to come true, is because we go further and further away from the Lord, and the established churches that we, we talked about just now, stuff is that he felt that what would happen toward the end is that we would go back to worshiping the way we used to in the respect of the mm. Jewish people in the early America who worshiped in the house, not within a big congregation and not outside with formalized religion, but the, the, the witness of Jesus Christ back to the basics. In other words. He, so he said that that would probably be coming because in one of them because sometimes the persecution that will probably be coming too. Sure. Yeah, and there's certainly in this day and age actually a very strong house church movement, yes. even within America, but especially within persecuted countries. Um, so certainly we are seeing that trend enacted. I think we need to be realistic about the, the benefits of having church structures like what we have right here. There are things that we can do as a body of 400 plus people that a house church of 12 cannot do. 
But you get a bunch of house churches together, and they have the ability to do things. But certainly there is upside to a house church, the, the fluidity, the, the ability to pivot so quickly, to care so quickly for people that they encounter. Um, there's lots of upside, certainly. So I, I think the, the, the real thrust of the Spirit is to, no matter what size group of people we're meeting with on a regular basis to worship with, that we're not so stuck in our structures, our rules, our legalism, that we miss out on the new, fresh breath of life that God wants to do in and through us. Denomination it is, a Christian church he's talking about, is that we don't let it get out of hand as we're talking about tonight and uh, people uh, go away from Christianity just because of what we discussed tonight and leaving it out of certain people's hands mm-hmm. instead of leaving it in Jesus' hands. Yeah. And worshiping specifically to him and with him. And, and in just common sense, but it, that's the way sometimes Yep. yep. Good. One more. Jessica. So what we talked about is it's interesting that it's the second generation. And it almost that, that Mark is writing to, most right. likely. That's what you're referring right. to, right? There's a second so, generation followers of Jesus, yes. But they're also maybe tired of the strictness. So it's like the second generation children have a tendency to stray a little bit away from the strictness of their parents. Kind of that same hmm. idea where it's like the church was so strict that the people that Jesus was bringing in were all of the people that had second generation had strayed from like rebellious teenagers kind of in a way. It's kind of how we were talking about That's it. interesting that, yeah. Um, it's it might be a little more open because of the, yeah, you know, the strictness that they had of their ancestors and that they might be a little more open. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably not that they're rebelling against first-generation Christians. It's that they're still pushing back against Judaism because um, (coughs) Christians were tied to— it was a Jewish sect, actually, in the first generation— um, it's not until, in fact, we see this, the, like just the very beginnings in the book of Acts, where you start to see people called Christians. That's a way that Luke, the writer, writer of Acts, is saying to us, they're starting to form their own unique identity apart from Judaism, but it's at the very preliminary stages at this point. So at, by the time we get to the writings of Mark and Matthew and Luke, they're, they're taking further steps in that direction, but they're not rebelling against Christians. They're rebelling more against Jews and Judaism, and especially. Law, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> that, right. Yes. Yes. Kind of like in the Jesus movement. They were rebelling against the strictness of it. It's the same, yeah. Children of the Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But don't you also think it's because there is no life and I mean, it's like the they were so surprised that Jesus spoke with authority. Yeah. Because everybody else who spoke, there was no life in what they were saying. Right. It's, just, just it's mostly no regurgitating life. laws they already yeah. knew and saying you should do this and shouldn't do that in light of this law. Blah blah yeah. blah. Yeah. Yeah. Which... Yeah. Not my favorite kind of preaching. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why Jesus attracts a large crowd of followers, which segues well to what we're going to cover next week. Uh, So I want to encourage you to go back and read through whatever sections you didn't actually read through from from what we covered tonight. So we started at verse 16 of chapter 1, made it all the way through verse 6 of chapter 3. If you want to read forward to where we're going to go next week, we're going to make it hopefully, fingers crossed, all the way to the end of 
Um, we're making it through chapter 5 all the way to verse 6 of chapter 6. That's the goal anyway. We'll see how well we can do that. So good job tonight. Good discussion. Thank you very much. Well done. If you want to give me homework for next week, you can. But mostly what I wanted were these conversations. So no homework is required.